tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are Marilyn Kent and author Makar Malconian. Writer performer Marilyn Kent, a native Californian, was the outspoken brunette on the comic duo of the comic duo, The Mommies. Tell us how The Mommies got started. Well, Carol uh, and I, Carol Christensen, who was the other mommy, she was my neighbor. She lived across the street from me. And I was the kind of person that made my children be in school plays. I created the plays and made them be stars. And they had no talent, and they didn't want to do it. And so they finally, at one point, just said, Mom, get an outlet. Go do this yourself. Is that right? Yeah, so, oh, so it was your kids that made My you. kids just <laughs> forced me. And then so I started taking a class in, um, in acting, but I, I hated it. I, it. I mean, there were 20-year-olds in the class. <laughs> class and I was 40 and uh, I wanted to be with someone who didn't call me dude <laughs> so I asked my next door, next door neighbor Carol to come to some classes with me promising her that we could talk about all the other people in the car on the way home oh, that was and, the, good. and but we got there and they were serious thespians and we were moms who just wanted to get out of the house so uh, we decided to put together a show um, for it, well, we, we touted it as a show for moms or women who don't want sex more than once a month. And we started filling the theaters in Northern California. But it was, a, it was a, a stage show. It was a stage show first, yes, that was it. And we did that for only two years before we got discovered in, uh, we went to the Montreal Comedy Festival, but oh. we were totally naive. We were, we had no clue. I mean, we were there in our little Mervyn's outfits and we were just, you know, we didn't know the word schmooze yet had not become part of our vocabulary. But Montreal was a great place for comedy, right? Absolutely. They did that, yeah. But we didn't understand what we were doing there. So what happened was, you know, they, they have this big building where Lily Tomlin was the host. <laughs> yeah. And then we were playing in this tiny little place called Club Soda. So we thought, well, we're not really part of the whole thing. This is where the, the babies, event happens. Yeah. yeah. And this is where we have we will do our show. We didn't realize that it was a showcase for all the networks. And as soon oh. as we were finished with our show, Joan, we were offered uh, full on from ABC, NBC, and CBS. But then you had an NBC sitcom. We is that what NBC. came out of that? Mm -hmm. Oh, it came out of that. Then you were nominated for awards for Showtime comedy Yes, we special. did our, our special, which was the original stage show. Oh, I We see. called it uh, My Kid Beat Up Your Honor Student, because I had the kind of kid that you know, you can't have that bumper sticker that says, you know, I'm a proud parent. But did you really <laughs> use your kids and your oh, household? Uh, absolutely. You know, there was one time where, see, I, I was talked about, at that time, my son was a teenager, and I had two sons, one that was on the honor roll and all wonderful, okay, I'm not going to talk about him. <laughs> Moms want to hear the bad stuff so right. they can feel good about their own kids. So I would talk about my other teenage son who, you know, every time I'd walk in the house, some girl was laying on him. He was the kind of kid that would get like an F in English and a C in Spanish. What, how did it happen? What right? is his original language here? Right. So it would be, you know, so so I remember um, I used to call the girls that laid on him Tiffany and and because I had to make up a name because the real ones, I did, he wouldn't let me use their real names. And he, then he started. Oh, so you started using them in your, in yeah, your absolutely. Uh, TV show? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. And then it became on the sitcom, Tiffany. Tiffany, oh, Tiffany with the monkey bites, oh, Tiffany. I see, Tiffany. Yeah. <laughs> and then you had a talk show. Yes, then we got a talk show. Uh, so it was an ABC talk show. Were you just, were you pinching yourself all the time? All and saying, the time. I lived in Santa Rosa, and how did I get? I was a housewife in Petaluma's where oh, we, Petaluma. I, well, I was born in Santa Rosa, but the little tiny dairy town of Petaluma. Chickens, you too, chicken, right? What's the chicken capital yes, of the world? I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I I know Petalumans are very proud of that. Uh, 
yeah, we were just these housewives vacuuming one day, and the next thing you know, we have a sitcom, a Showtime special, an ABC talk show. And then you became a spokesman. For a spokesperson for Sears oh, and yeah. Serta and Campbell's Soup. Was it all during the same time or was it uh, It was after? pretty much the, around the same time. We we mostly did Palmolive ads. I'm known for the, saying the one, the, the saying, uh, she always gets the easy ones. I was like the foil to Carol's uh, <laughs> oh, whatever <laughs> Palmolive dishy thing. But oh, we, was that Yeah, it? we did Palmolive for seven oh, years oh and, and, what, and we were the last spokes people for Paul All Mollett. through the time when uh -huh. you were doing um, all the talk show That's and right. showcases. Then you co-authored books. Were those together? Were they well, during this time? No, after that, Carol and I decided to write a book, like an Irma Bombeck type oh, of book. I see, yeah. And that's called The Mother Load. And that that one is just little, wonderful little stories about our oh, life at, in the in the hood, in the neighborhood. But then yeah. you also wrote To Know Me Is To Love Me. Oh yes, that I wrote with a therapist um, who... <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Well, I, tr I believe in two <laughs> things that get me through life, a therapist and Prozac. <laughs> yeah, so so I recommend them highly. To, to know me is to love me is to take um, some Prozac. Now, I wrote oh. that with Lynn Lott, and then I wrote The Mother Load with Carol. Uh -huh. And then, uh, then... Not your mother's midlife. That's my latest. The, the last two are, they're the heart and soul of who I am now. Not your mother's midlife. N not your mother's midlife is... It's a 10-step guide to fearless aging. And what we mean by fearless aging is, is actually to fear less, because mm. there's a lot to fear. Yes. And it, it, it's not so much the, about the wrinkles and the varicose veins. Things come to us naturally in midlife that can be really tough things. For example, watching our, our parents at, in oh, their decline. Right. And, and that's uh, a natural situation. That is. We get to midlife and that's what happens to It, it is something we all have to family. go through. And it, w I want women to know they're not alone in this. I want women to talk about these things. I've learned so much. You know, I teach fearless aging classes. So you teach a class in this too. You yes. wrote the book. You also teach a class in it. Uh -huh. and, and the point of the, of the class in the book is that the more we talk about it and the more we connect and the more we we go back to being like it used to be for our moms you see in our moms days they they lived in a neighborhood where every every woman was close with another one our grandmothers right. had the quilting well right. right now women seem to be dispersed they're very very busy and in our cars so much right. and on our cell phones so that that moment where you really dig deep into your heart about what's really hurting you about having to put your mom in a home or Right. emptiness that doesn't come up so often so that's because they what don't share it is that well why? it's not that they wouldn't it's that we don't have time for it because what we oh. do as women is we when we get together we we tend to do it like every six weeks and have a have a big dinner and we do catch-up time but then right. we're talking about our kids and our husbands right. and and not but, but caring that, about sex anymore or, or wanting sex and all up. of that but not the real deeper things and that's what this book oh, this is the meat and potatoes of how do a fearlessly that, that's that your and the classes major. not and your mother's midlife but, but you have did you write a book for boomer babe and then it became this play or no, is it just what, a group this of, is all because you have a new you have a play a new play called boomer babe it's at the unlimited the uh, theater, theater unlimited, unlimited in yep. north hollywood yes okay the play it's really a stage show it's it's a little bit of stand up a little bit of of song parodies a little bit of poignant strong pieces and th that is all all of these things are part of what we're calling the fearless aging movement oh, so that I see. Okay, so Nancy <laughs> Allspa, who happens to be Matt Lauer's ex-wife, Nancy and I um, have have formed what we are calling the fearless aging movement, and the purpose is to get people to be proud of who they are and to look at the second half of their life as being strong, fearless women, and not just fade away because we turned forty. But do they have to have men in their lives? They don't have to. Men men have a hard time in midlife as well. We focus a little more on, on women because we are women and that's but we from always, where we talk. We but. always focus about men saying they reach midlife and they want to get rid of all 
some life up to that point some men and do. start anew. Yeah, it's and really, you're teaching us to be... Think of it as a second half. Yes. Think, it, think of that you have a whole second... You know, the, the, the killer is that... Well, it's opposite than killer. We have added 20 years to our life. The human ex right. life expectancy has gained 20 years and it's gained in the middle. So what are you going to do with that middle? Are you going to fade away? Or, you know, can you only have one heyday? You no. Know, you can revive. You can start to do the things that you couldn't do before because right now you have more confidence. We have, we have all of those things. We yes. also start having more medical problems. Yes, we do. Our body starts slowing down. Other things happen to us that weren't happening in the first part. Yes. So we have to deal with those things yeah. too. Well, then that just goes in, back to drugs. <laughs> <laughs> do you believe in plastic surgery to keep a oh, young look? Plastic surgery or not, it doesn't even matter. To be oh. fearless inside, yes. you know, you don't, you just, listen, I had an eye job years ago. I want another one, but I've been concentrating now more on this. I call this my action right here. But you're not afraid to, to go in and do this? Oh, <laughs> don't no. do that to Oh, me. God, my <laughs> husband, the other night, he pulled me over to kiss him. He pulled me over by my action. I just had to slap him. No, is no. Is this all part of your show? Some of it, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. But you don't want to become, you know, there's a, there's a fine line between getting plastic surgery and then looking like a kitty yeah you know you don't want to go around like right. that and you don't want to be like Joan Rivers right yours seems well, like yeah. a little different kind of a, approach to aging it well it's different in that even though it's almost comedy. everything is accepted as long as you don't think of yourself as less than or shrivel away but it's not about the outside because everyone's going to age on the inside everyone has yes, to go through exactly the same thing and no matter how beautiful and uh, you know how well kept you are what a handsome woman you are <laughs> yes, all of that it doesn't matter <laughs> because inside it's what you tell yourself and that makes all the difference and I'm a big advocate of starting to learn where you really are beautiful it you know youth is what it is on purpose youth will drive men to run after the women with the pulsating ovum you know <laughs> because it keeps the species going <laughs> you know and it is as it as it should be it, it's not like I feel like I'm envious or, or, or jealous of young, beautiful women. Right. I appreciate a beautiful young woman. I, I, they, because there are daughters now. There are daughters. <laughs> Why not? It's true. There are daughters at this point. They are. It's, it's about realizing that there is also a place for a woman who is, like, look, I'm 57. But a woman who is full of passion and sense of where they're going and what they want to do to make the world a better place, and they walk into the room, they cause as many head turns as the young ones with the big perky breasts. It's like it doesn't matter where your breasts are if you're full of passion and you're, and you're full of, of nice, you know, a good sense of who you are. You think they'll listen to you and not look at that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, oh, hell, I never wear a bra. I don't have a bra on now. I don't care. I don't care. So they will listen to you. Oh, yes, Someone they when will. you walk into a room. Well, if it's not all about you, yes. if you're wanting to exactly. be with humanity, That's then true. of course. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And, I, and the baby boomer, baby, no, boomer babe. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you just a little okay, bit about this. Just little, a little this. bit. Okay. So this is, this is a stage show designed for baby boomers. You know, there's 78 million of us. And what age are they now? They, uh, the, well, baby boomer, well, we're considering uh, midlife to be between 40 and 65 yeah. now. We don't have yeah. baby boomers anymore. I mean, they're already matriculated. Oh, yes, that's right. So that's we, right. We, do we have a well, new say? It, uh, the newest the new the, uh, for us, well, we're just turning it to boomer babes because, okay. you know, you can still be a babe in your own little way. I got it. Bra okay. or not. So you, you, you're up on stage, the three of you at one time? There's three of us. Uh, Nancy it talks about, this is Nancy Alspa. She is there to do, talk about infertility, and um, she has a, 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 a very compelling story about thinking you could wait 
forever to have a baby and then all, how hard it was for her to finally have a baby. Yeah, so that's an that's interesting That's Nancy. Yeah. And then Janice is uh, 54 and has never been married. And so she talks about the dating world of a 50-year-old oh. and what life is like like that uh, and internet dating and all those things, uh, okay? Good very interesting and I talk about um, well I, I make a comparison good or bad what are the things in midlife and I also talk about the empty nest oh right and then I talk about that. my mom as she starts to decline and um, what it does for me to watch this so it becomes poignant I mean you have very little poignant. poignant episodes among in the between color, yeah. hilarity yeah yeah <gasps> Marilyn, thanks yeah. for being with oh, us. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for being here today. And thanks for watching this part of the show. We'll be right back with our author, Mark R. Malconian. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Mark R. Malconian is a teacher and a writer who earned his PhD in philosophy from the University of Massachusetts. He's written books, uh, Marxism, A Cold War Primer, and Richard Porte's Politics. And his newest is My Brother's Road. What have you taught as a teacher? Oh, I taught philosophy, and my oh, books did. are on philosophy. The I philosophy see. Books. That's what I was going to ask you. So after you got your PhD, did you plan to teach? Yeah, yeah, but um, as it turned out, see, we never know what's going to happen in our lives. As it turned out, uh, my brother Monty uh, uh, was killed in battle uh, at about the time, just before I finished my, my dissertation. So I sort of had to switch emphasis. Was your, um, uh, was your dissertation on Marxism? Was it that yeah, one? Yeah, it, oh, it, it was on philosophy of <laughs> science, American pragmatism, and Marxism. Tell us a little bit about that book, and then I want to ask you who uh, Richard Rorty is. Oh, okay. Well, see, that's philosophy. Now, the new book, uh, uh, this is the first book I've written that's a real trade book. That is to say, a book that isn't a, an academic book. Uh, okay, so previously I've written uh, books on philosophy, and Richard Rorty is maybe one of the best known, that is to say, pretty unknown, but one of the best known American philosophers. He's a pragmatist, and, um, and uh, he uh, has a lot to say about America and the world today. Why did you choose him as your subject? I mean, I mm -hmm. can see choosing you know, Marx, mm -hmm. but somebody like... It, was he an idol of yours? Or? No, he wasn't an idol. Actually, I chose him because this was around, uh, this was the early 90s. And at that time, um, well, since you brought it up, see, uh, I've been a Marxist for most of my adult life, a Marxist. And around Which the early believes in. I'm sorry? Which believes in. Well, uh, the idea that, I guess, to put it in a, in a nutshell, it would be like this. The idea that we can understand society and history uh, along the same lines of understanding other parts of nature. The way I see it, it's a, an, a naturalized view of, of history. So the, the, old, the old line is, Darwin historicized nature, Marx naturalized history. So anyway, it's something like that. I we see. can understand human beings and human society uh, along the same lines that we can understand other uh, species. But I think animals. that that is what helped you get into this book on your brother because mm -hmm. you can see a lot of what you're talking about. That's why I wanted you to, to, to yeah, just mention you. a yeah. little bit of that mm -hmm. because the, the, my brother's road has that feeling of what you're talking about now, what you're telling us. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with Richard Rorty, was mm -hmm. he that kind of... Uh, no, Richard Rorty was not a Marxist. So I, I, I decided to, around the early see, 90s, see all of my friends were Marxists, were ha having these deep... Uh, reconsiderations of their views of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of, uh, Soviet, uh, of the Soviet Union. So I decided I wanted <coughs> to review, systematically review my beliefs up until then. I see. And so Richard Rorty seemed to me to be one of the most intelligent, uh, offering one of the most intelligent alternatives to Marxism. So I started oh. uh, studying Richard, Richard Rorty. He's not a Marxist at all. He's a pragmatist. I see. I see. So that's why I, I started studying. And then as but I did But do they that, work together? Can it work together? Well, no, not really. Not because, really. I see. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. 
see, that's the sort of thing a philosopher would say, yes and no. Uh, yes and no. Um, but that's how you can attack it, I guess. You have to be able to see both yeah. sides of it yeah, if you're oh, a yeah, philosopher. For sure. And that's where I wanted to, to study him. I wanted to get uh, this, the smartest uh, opponent oh, of my previous views. And in the course of writing that book, I changed my views. <laughs> that's the oh. mark of a, good, of a good book, I think, from the position of a, of a writer how much you change, the writer himself or herself, changes during the course of writing the book. So writing the last book changed you. Now let's talk about My Brother's Road, mm -hmm. because how long have you been working on that book? Yeah, okay. Seven years of research and writing. Seven years of research. Yeah, and, and then one more year of pre preparing it for publication. It's the, l it's the biggest project I've ever taken on. And I'm not going to take on another project like this. But as you were writing it seven years, mm -hmm. were you, you were teaching. Were you, mm -hmm. doing, you were doing uh, other yeah. things, Raising right? Raising kids, yeah, right. chasing paychecks. Right. Having a family, right. all that. Were you applying, say, was it conscious when you were researching that you were looking for these Marxist philosophies, mm -hmm. this idealism? Mm -hmm. Because your brother was obviously an idealist. Yes, but... Was he a Marxist? Yeah, good, okay. Okay, let's start there. I guess this, the short answer to that is yes in the last years of his life. Oh, but, uh. but was he behaving like a mark? Was he um, involved in, you know, an international solidarity kind of thing in his last year? See, most of his life, my, my, most of his life, my brother was, let's call it a Middle Eastern militant. We won't use the T word, a, a, a militant in the Middle East. He's an American kid who <laughs> um, embarked on a, a, a long journey in his short life. He was 35 and a half years uh, old when he died. He died in, uh, June 12th, 1993, 35 so years old. But he, it was a long road. And during the uh, half of his life, he was uh, involved in uh, Lebanon, Lebanese Civil War, the revolution in Iran, in Kurdistan, and other things. And he gradually became a Marxist. But the last several years of his life, was a different period of history. It Let's was the collapse back. of the Soviet Union, right. and so he g became involved in some in, in another movement, which was really a nationalist movement, not an internationalist movement. Right. right. But the first part, the internationalist movement in mm -hmm. Lebanon and uh, mm -hmm. Kurdistan and wherever you were mm -hmm. talking about, um, he, he was Armenian. You're Armenian. Armenian. I'm Armenian. Uh -huh. We were born here. He uh -huh. was born in California, just uh -huh. to, like. I was born in California, uh -huh. and you were born in California. Uh -huh. And Armenians are but, but, basically... But you know, it's interesting what you said. You said he was Armenian. He is, well, well, yeah. Well, was he? Uh, he, uh, he was born, he's an American. You know, up until, uh, oh, right. so, uh, up until adulthood, he was basically an American. English was his first language. His parents were born near Fresno. He was born near Fresno. Um, his great-grandfather arrived in California in the cowboy days. Cowboy days. He was one of the first uh, people from the Ottoman Empire to own land in Fresno County. So, in a way, he was American, but he transformed himself during the course of his life in a, the hardest way possible. He transformed himself into an Armenian. He decided he wanted to do that. Yeah, it was because a conscious he did decision on his part. Th that part of it, but the other part of the Armenian identity is mm -hmm. the oldest Christian right. mm -hmm. uh, nation. Mm -hmm. And so he was obviously, you boys were raised Christian sure. in, in mm -hmm. uh, Tulare or wherever mm -hmm. you were up mm -hmm. in the valley. And yet he, talking about that internationalization, mm -hmm. he went to Lebanon, to Afghanistan, and fought with Muslims and fought with people mm -hmm. who weren't Christian, right. was on mm -hmm. their side. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then when he turned it around, like you said, at the end, Mm -hmm. He had that Armenian identity. Yeah, but it was always this. If he were here, he would say this, but I think it's true, too. He was always on the side of, that he considered the underdog. Okay, that's the okay. point, So I in think. Lebanon, uh, it was portrayed, oh, as, it was portrayed <coughs> as uh, Muslims against Christians. Actually, the, so, the supposed Muslim side had many Christians. I don't want to go into that. Yeah, but it wasn't exactly, talk about but Monty the But Monty considered that to be, Monty considered that to be, that side to be the uh, the underdogs, the poor people in I Lebanon, see. and similarly with Iran, it was uh, he just really didn't like the Shah of Iran, and uh, for, for for reasons I go into in the book, very personal reasons, personal experiences, so it was natural for him to go against I that, see. and uh, and Kurdistan was another story. So. I see. How did you actually research? Yeah. Okay. Now. After Monty died, a, fr a writer friend of mine 
called me up and he said, Mark, you've got to sit down and you've got to write a book about this guy. You've got to write from your heart. But then I thought about that and I thought, hey, even if I were the kind of author, the kind of writer who could write a book from the heart, you can't write a book about Monty's life story from the heart. His life story can only be written after a lot of research. Why? Right. Where, how'd you get it? Yeah. Some were videotapes. I heard you, uh, I read at the mm -hmm. end he was videotaping things. Yeah. Did yeah. that help? He had so many secrets. You know, he was, <laughs> he, uh, he, he had 12, 12, right. 12 fake passports, 12 aliases, going 12 different, he had lots of secrets. He spent much of his life in guerrilla camps, in a, a Red Brigade safe houses, in prisons. Prisons, uh, yeah. So, uh, and to, to try to reconstruct this, it wasn't easy. So I went to, you know, four, four countries, did hundreds of interviews in three, three or four different languages, uh, went through thousands of documents, freedom of information documents, legal documents, thousands of letters, uh, un unpublished writings, things like that. And gradually I was able to piece this together. One thing that was on your side is, since he was so young, that the people are still living that he was um, yeah. uh, active with. So did you do a lot of in, a in lot, people? A uh, lot, but this is, this is something in interesting to me. You know, if I were to try to write the book now, start now to write this yeah. book, it would be a completely different book and it would be far less authoritative, far less accurate. It's so strange how people's memories yes. change yes. and they, they will swear that something happened 10 years ago and that didn't happen. I, it's really changed. Writing this book has very much changed my view of lots of other books that I've read in the past, you know, biographies <coughs> especially. Because people who write a biography 10 years after, uh, after the death of the, uh, of the person they're writing about, you can't be sure at all that, 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 it's, yeah. that it's even in the ballpark. That's really interesting because I think many of the things that you had to go back and recreate Mm -hmm. were changed even in the countries that you went to. I, I, I stood there with my jaw slack, listening to people uh, in 2003, whom I had talked to in, in uh, 10 years earlier, uh, telling me a completely different story than they had told me 10 years earlier. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so, so, you know, you gotta, the more information you come to an interview with, you know this, the, the better the interview yeah, comes out. Exactly. So you have to... But let me tell you, we've run out of time, but this book is just, you can't put it down. Oh, and it's you. so interesting, and there's so many things to read about, and, it's, and it's so many questions come up. And I wanted you to just give us a little flavor of it, because I think people have to read it themselves and really experience My Brother's Road. Thank well, you. Thank you, Joan, and thank, thank you, you for inviting me today. Thank you. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017.